The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the second virtual edition of The Mogcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home in virtual conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg. And Jacob, a very good morning to you. Uh, Good morning, Paul. Um, Let me um, start uh, at the beginning. There's so much we could discuss about the coronavirus crisis by narrowing in on your particular responsibilities and role as leader of the House and having a bit of a think about how Parliament is doing um, as uh, these events go on. And I want to begin just by trying to tease out of you what the Commons now can do and can't do, because that seems to me to be important. So just right at the beginning, can an, can an MP um, ask a supplementary oral question to one that isn't his own? Um, the, the questions are running as closely to normal as possible, but everybody is listed. So there's no randomness in supplementary questions. And just by way of um, making inquiry about speeches, can an MP intervene in another MP's speech as they could normally do in the chamber? No, that can't happen. And that can't happen <clears throat> whether you're a moat or whether you are um, uh, in the chamber itself. To ensure that there's equality between uh, virtual appearances, interventions had to be stopped. And is it possible for an MP to raise a point of order? Uh, not, <clears throat> not by standing up on the um, floor or doing it from uh, a remote location, but it has to be done by correspondence with the Speaker. Um, the reason I'm ticking through these questions about um, procedure, uh, which might on the face of it sound rather dull, is that I'm trying to get a sense of to what degree Parliament can operate um, as a legislature that holds the executive in check during this crisis. I mean, obviously, the fact that it's operating virtually isn't anyone's fault. That's a consequence of the coronavirus. But I try to ask myself, and would be interested in finding out from you, just how effective do you think it's managing to be, given the constraints that I'm trying to tease out of you? Well, you're very right to raise these questions because they show why a virtual parliament is second best to a real parliament, that a debate without interventions is like an egg without salt, to quote the old punch cartoon, Um, that you need interventions to have the flow uh, and to create that excitement that parliamentary occasions can, can create. But that we are here at all is really remarkable that we have a parliament where members can be fully uh, engaged, where government can be scrutinized and held to account, where constituency issues can be raised, and where legislation can be brought through. It is a really remarkable achievement by the House authorities. And from next week, we are likely to have voting. Uh, Just before we started recording, another test of voting was done uh, to see that people could um, send in a, a division decision remotely. And so, yes, we can have scrutiny. Yes, we can have legislature uh, legislation, uh, but it's not a full parliament. It's not doing everything that parliament does, and it doesn't have that atmosphere. How are you doing on remote voting, by the way? I mean, there was a very um, well-publicized um, crash um, last week, I think, on the, the first attempted virtual vote. But for all I know, there may have been a second one that has been more successful. Um, the first one didn't work because people could only use it from equipment handed out by the parliamentary authorities because uh, of the firewalls that were in place against people's own private machines. Once those firewalls were changed, the second one uh, seems to have worked. And the third one, which started just before uh, we started recording, seems to have worked as well, but it only closed about five minutes ago. Let me come back to uh, the role of Parliament and try um, this thought on you. Um, Inevitably, um, policy in responding to this unique um, 
event uh, is going to be controversial. And um, there are broadly three strategic routes that the government could take. Um, it could continue with the present lockdown and infinitum. Um, it could take a kind of Swedish route, which is very popular with some of my colleagues on the right, or it could do what it appears it's not going to do, which is to take a route that's more South Korean and is dependent on tracking and tracing to uh, solve the problem uh, insofar as it can be solved. Um, how important is it at this time that effectively the executive is operating um, without full scrutiny? Because as we both agree, um, the present virtual parliament, however admirable, it can't create that sense of momentum. It can't um, have what you described as that flow that can really put ministers uh, on the spot and make life difficult for them, um, as is sometimes required. Um, look, I certainly prefer a physical parliament to a virtual parliament, but I think there is scrutiny and MPs will be raising issues both privately and publicly, um, but exclusively the parliamentary debate. And people are discussing up and down the country, and Conservative Home is discussing uh, what the right answers are. And I think that is part of the background to the decisions being made by the executive, some of which m may require future legislation, in which case they'll have to get a majority in Parliament. So far, there has been a huge consensus supporting, and that's been with the nation at large and in Parliament. And therefore, scrutiny in those times is different. It's about the challenges and targets and so on, rather than the overall direction of policy. Um, nor last forever, at which point the type of um, scrutiny changes. Just a last question on Parliament. Do you see... Um any of the procedure changing in any um, significant way over the next few weeks? Um, well, I, I think the key thing to say is government getting its programme through. So if these voting tests work, in which case the government's legislative programme uh, will be able to proceed beyond the coronavirus and beyond agreed and non-controversial measures. And so that procedure as a development and an evolution to allow Parliament to be doing uh, more and potentially more controversial work. It's part of the process of restoring normality uh, that we will be having uh, debates on some of the more controversial issues. Just on that point of restoring normality, is it your understanding that we'll get a statement um, from the Prime Minister next Sunday, and he made his original lockdown statement on a Sunday evening, March 23rd, from memory. Um, and um, are you able to cast any light on reports that he'll be making a similar broadcast this coming Sunday? Um, I, I, I don't know. The um, information I have is that we're going to have more uh, from the government on where we are towards the end of the week. And that gets us into the interesting and theological debate of where do you start the week and end the week. Um, I'm probably with you on it starting on a Sunday, uh, but it may be that government communications think that Sunday is the last day of the week uh, being imbued with um, the teaching of the Catholic Church than we are. I'm interested you say that because I was puzzling um, yesterday evening over the use of this week in the press conference and the very clear briefing it will be a Sunday. But let me move on um, to try to uh, ask some of the bigger questions. And I'm going to ask some of these in a devil's advocate sort of way, just to try to tease some of the issues out. I mean, there's a very big um, vogue um, on the right, uh, and I'm seeing it very well marked uh, at the moment in the pages of the Daily Telegraph, but ending the lockdown now. And the critique of the government is that we should, from the start, have been doing a Sweden, uh, as it's known. And we should have had a much looser lockdown, voluntary social distancing, and so on and so forth, um, in order to um, uh, ensure that the economy didn't altogether grind to a halt. Success of the government, though it's not really the success of the government, it's the success of the British people, is that it has been taken up by the British people who decided it was the right thing to do. It's been a lockdown of consent, not of compulsion. 
And I think that's crucial. I, I think that sometimes one thinks government is more powerful than it really is. If uh, people hadn't decided they wanted a lockdown, there wouldn't be one. Whether you could never have fined enough people, you could never have arrested enough people to enforce it. But the British people decided that they wanted a lockdown and implemented of their own free will a lockdown slightly stricter than the government was actually calling for. And this has been key to the British people's success in lowering the spread of the disease. So I, I think one has to look at this in a more nuanced way and say that actually the government has gone with the pace and the mood of the British people and has got that right. And I think it will continue to get it right as steps are taken to come out of lockdown. So I think the idea that we could suddenly pretend to be Swedes um, is as unrealistic as pretending that we could suddenly become South Koreans. We're not actually going to be either. We're going to be British. Again, wearing my devil's advocate hat or horns, uh, some of my colleagues on the right are saying, this is terrible. What has become of the buccaneering, liberty-loving, freedom-spirited British people that we've been proud not about like this? in such a way that we're now going to destroy our economic prospects for a generation um, because we've become too statist and subservient to move from our homes. Yes, but you see, I think it's not like that. I think the British people decided this is what they wanted to do rather than it being enforced upon them. Um, but if you look at the number of penalties issued by the police and compare it, for example, to France, it's a fraction of the... Uh, um, a number that have been issued in France, and yet our lockdown has been compar comparably effective. So I don't see it as a supine British people being bullied by an authoritarian government. Uh, I actually think the government uh, and the British people have gone in lockstep together, and dare I say, this is um, a great tribute to the Prime Minister because he has a great feel for an understanding of the mood of the British people and works with the grain of the British people rather than against it. Just as a variant on that question, which is, in a sense, has the government done its work too well? Um, there's been, um, at the core of what the government's communicated, its message that you should stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. I mean, backed up by some pretty snazzy advertising on Twitter and elsewhere. Is there a case for saying that you've done your work so well now that there'll be a problem coaxing the British people to get out of lockdown and go back to work? Um, I think that the success um, has been greater than the government expected but that by working with the consent of the people, it means that the lockdown, when the consent is for it to end, will be something that people are buying into, and that it's all about going with the grain of what people want to do. And when people are ready, and the government announces that the five tests uh, have been met, I think things will, will ease back. But um, no one is saying that we will go back to where we were at the beginning of the year overnight. It will be a process back to that, which may take some time. And so I think the success of the policy, the um, uh, consent of the British people, leaves us in a good position rather than a bad position. Have you spoken to the Prime Minister recently, by the way? What sort of spirits is he in, if you have? Um, uh, um, that's a very unfair question of you. I don't think I should discuss private conversations with, uh, with, with, with the Prime Minister. Um, I, I, um, I will leave it at the public communication. So I certainly saw him on Zoom at the, at the Cabinet, um, but he seems to be in very good spirits. Well, I'm sorry to be unfair. Let's try another question that may or may not be more fair, um, namely this. Um, uh, just looking ahead to um, uh, the government's plans, it's pretty clear the government broadly wants to follow what I'd vulgarly describe as a South Korean kind of strategy. You get the number of cases and deaths down and then implement a um, vigorous sort of track and trace system as the South Koreans did. The South Koreans did this from a sort of standing start of having almost no cases. 
We're starting from a position of um, having had, however you count it, thousands of deaths. So isn't it reasonable to assume it'll take us quite a bit of time to get to a South Korean position? Well, I, I think we're clearly not there yet. And the um, uh, testing track and tracing is being developed and the test is being done, uh, as you know, on the Isle of Wight to see um, how, how it works. Uh, but I, I think one always has to be very careful about these comparisons with, with other countries. We're, we're not South Korea. We don't have the South Korean culture. We don't have the same problem as, as South Korea. We've got a very different one. Um, and as you say, the numbers are, are, are different. And, and so it, it can't work in the same way here as it does in South Korea. It obviously can't. Can I prove you about this point of um, comparisons? I mean, obviously, um, the, the, my other colleagues in the media uh, are taken up with comparing this country with that country and drawing up league tables and so on and, and so forth. But just give us your take on uh, how far it's possible, if at all, to compare one country's um, progress with the coronavirus against another's. Um, on a day, daily basis, I don't think it's possible. I think it may well be possible uh, in a year or two's time to look back and see how things have progressed. But you always have issues over the quality of the data that are being used and how accurate they are. And you have um, uh, uh, all sorts of different things. You, you still have questions arising as to what effect climate plays on the coronavirus. As far as I'm aware, it still hasn't been settled as to whether it is a disease of the winter and spring rather than of the summer and what effect sunshine has. And so once you've started adjusting for climate and uh, cultural factors and so on, I think international comparisons, even in a year or two's time, are going to be quite difficult. Let, let me try this another way. This really is, as it were, my question rather than none wearing an imaginary hat. When you put together all the variables, um, such as family structure, ethnic makeup, openness to international travel, the recording of statistics. So, for example, the Germans uh, record deaths in a completely different way to the way we do. When you put all that together, isn't it really the case, as Liam Fox has been arguing in a very distinguished way on Tom Ho, we're really not going to know uh, which countries handle this better than others, probably for at least two years until the studies start rolling in? Uh, well, I, I think Liam is right, um, uh, uh, as he very often is. That I, I, That's why I said you can't make daily comparisons because the, the counting of information is, is different. And as you rightly quote him saying, the openness of societies to international travel and all sorts of things, the urban nature of society, it does seem to affect people less in the countryside than it does in, in urban areas. So all, all these factors... Um, will lead to different results. And also, I don't really see that the international comparisons help you that much. I think you can learn from what other countries do and adapt from what they've done to help you through the crisis. But saying uh, this country's done better than that country doesn't really help you. You want to carry on with the policy that you think will help your country the most. Are these ultimately political or scientific decisions? Well, it's a bit of both, aren't they? That um, uh, people listen to the science, and some of the science is authoritative, and some of the science is theoretical, and they have to make decisions politically based on on that information. A line of criticism, of course, is that the government's basically left itself a, a hostage now to its scientific advisors in that. Um, if the advisors say, uh, don't proceed, you can't do anything at all to tamper with the lockdown, uh, the government, since it said it will be guided by the science, will have no choice but to follow them. Um, well, the, the five tests as to leaving lockdown are based on science, but the decision on them is not ultimately uh, scientific, is it? And, and the scientists themselves say that they can't tell you what the R number is Precisely, they can only give a range, 
and therefore you're always basing, as with all political decisions, uh, your final decision on the best available information, but not on uh, the entirety of the information. What's your sense of um, what your colleagues are saying to you overall about the lockdown? I mean, I'm aware that um, you know it, the Daily Telegraph, which is um, a, a very anti-lockdown paper. There's no great secret about that. Uh, was having a big push today about Steve Baker and Graham Brady and Charles Walker and others raising concerns about the lockdown. I mean, do you get the sense your colleagues are? Uh, champing at the bit, or do you get the sense um, rather that they're um, uh, relatively happy to wait until the Prime Minister's broadcast this or next week, whatever it may be? I think the Prime Minister has huge support from the country at large, not just from Conservative MPs. I think his judgments have been very good so far, and people have confidence in him to continue to make uh, the right judgments. Uh, I think people... Um, they are thinking two things simultaneously. They want the lockdown to be eased, but they only want it done when the time is right to ease it. And so, yes, people want that to happen. They're looking forward to it happening. But equally, there's a desire for it not to happen too early. And I go back to the point I made already. I, I think British public opinion and where the government is are very closely aligned. And that's really, really important. I, I mean, I I can't stress enough how good it is that we have done this by consent. It, think how terrible it would have been if we had been arresting hundreds of thousands of people rather than giving fines out to uh, a few thousand, and how un-British that would have been, and how that would have been a real snatch of power by the state. Because in fact, this has been done voluntarily by people thinking, yes, that sounds sensible. And perhaps, though this may be a little bit optimistic, perhaps we've restored some trust in our governmental systems and so that people feel they can actually trust the government and that possibly because of what they know about the Prime Minister and the fact that he is somebody who believes in liberty and not somebody who they thought might ever want to do this, that they recognise he's only done it because he had to, not because he wanted to, and therefore they're trusting him to tell us when the time is safe for us to uh, lessen the lockdown. Let's just end on a variant of that point. Uh, the government's um, poll ratings are stupendously good. There's some polling evidence to suggest, as a point you just alluded to a moment ago, that the ratings of politicians overall have risen um, during this crisis. Just in the light of all that, just I might end by asking you what you make of Keir Starmer's start as leader of the opposition. Um. I think Keir Starmer has made a good start as, as leader of the opposition. Um, he is an intelligent, uh, able man, um, as I think is widely known and appreciated. But most importantly, he has made the Labour Party once again a moderate centre-left party that, that um, the hard left that was in charge has been pretty much removed. Um, if, however, I could give him one piece of advice, which he probably wouldn't want, I'd suggest he asks shorter questions at PMQs, because if um, he goes on too long, the questions lose their bite. <laughs> well, on that final piece of advice to uh, use the opposition, um, over this great virtual distance, um, I wish you a very good day. Uh, that's the end of the podcast, and uh, I look forward to seeing you, though regretfully, I suppose, not in person, in a fortnight's time. I much look forward to renewing our conversation in a fortnight, um, and, and thank you, and uh, I hope all the listeners to um, Conservative Home and readers are keeping well and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. The Mogcast. Fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.